Hi, this is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and welcome to the December Media Church Live event. And let me extend to you from uh, myself and my wife Kitty uh, a happy holiday and a, a Merry Christmas season to you. And I just want to encourage you, whether you have a large family around you or not, to go and do something good for yourself. Do something sweet for those you love. Don't allow the holiday time to be a stressful time where you're reminded of what you do or don't have or what you can or cannot do uh, for others. Let's remember that it's about giving not of our things, but it's about giving of ourselves, even as Jesus gave to us. The very inception of the birth of Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, it was all, let's always remember, it was a father giving a son that he might receive many sons and daughters. So from the very beginning, it was a family proposition. And uh, it's an honor to bring Media Church to you. We've been doing me the monthly live Media Church events now for uh, just at a year. We also do every month, we do a live war room prayer event where it's not just a teaching on prayer, but it's a time of prayer. And that will be a week from tonight, which is the evening of the 19th, 7 Central Time. And I'll be sending out reminders and invitations for you to participate in that. And in those invitations, if you go to mediachurch.net, you'll see a link down on the lower uh, right, lower left, where you can make a prayer request. And we also give out a number during the War Room meetings where you can text your requests in live. It's just so important. Prayer, like my grandmother used to say, and she had a plaque that I, w I actually was able to get as a gift from my father. And the plaque that was on her uh, mantle was prayer changes things. And uh, the scripture says men ought always to pray and not to faint. And the Amplified says turn coward, faint, or fail. God's portion for our lives is not failure. And yes, it's true that He knows everything that uh, we need even before we ask, but it's in His economy. It's in the part of the economy of God that we ask. Because in the asking, we enter into God's process uh, by which His process initiates as hope. Uh, we enter into that process through obedience and prayer. And the end of that process is that being produced which we have need of. So let's just have a word of prayer right now. Father, we thank you for those that are connecting in Media Church Live. Father, this is your missions base on the internet. We want to be more than just a broadcast, more than just uh, giving forth a teaching. Lord, we want to have impact on the lives of those that connect with what we're doing. You said that in 2014 you'd begin to raise up a 6,000 member ecclesia. And we're believing for the ecclesia of God to be raised up that we might do the work of the kingdom. And we're going to talk about that tonight, Lord, but not only to do the work of the kingdom, but be a comfort one to another. Father God, I ask that you would create an atmosphere, a familial atmosphere among your people. And I realize, Lord, that the internet and technology can be a very anemic means of establishing relationship, but you take the foolish things and the weak things to confound the things that are mighty or wise in terms of this man's, the world's wisdom, but that you would create a true Kononia fellowship, that you would so draw your family together through Media Church, Father God, through Father's Heart Ministry, through the Ecclesia Project, that you would draw together a family 
whose maxim, whose byword would be, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Because, Lord, we're so quick to jettison relationships that uh, you said you, you're always on task and you're always on time and your patience goes so far beyond ours. God, give us the patience, the determination, the love, and the fidelity in the context of spiritual family to stay in one another's lives and even through the sometimes the, the casual, shallow uh, nature of, tech, uh, of uh, internet communication. But God, you give us substantive connection one to another. Lord, we're asking for something that's above the human level, something that's real, something, something that has substance and depth. Because if it's, we want to keep it real, Father. We want to keep it real with you and real with one another. Real love, real connection, real relationship. And we thank you uh, that, uh, Lord, maybe we're not that right now. But Lord, we exist. Because of our vision, we exist, Father God, as a testimony to that purpose that you have. To bring together not just to people interacting in the context of a religious infrastructure, but people coming together in spiritual community that means something to one another and are plugged into your purpose in the earth wherever people are connecting. We know we have people, Lord, that come in through Western Europe. They come in from the Arabian Peninsula, from New Zealand, Australia, and Canada, the United States, and, and uh, Malaysia, and, and uh, Singapore as well. And Father, we just pray for all of these that are your kids. They're your kids, Father God. And you, you love them. You love them unconditionally. You love us, Father, no strings attached. Your mercy is renewed every morning. You're so fully capable of loving us to the point that anything you desire of us would be produced. That uh, you don't have a need for, uh, for the false sternness of religious rigidity father god you just love us with an unending love and it's your love and your goodness that produces in us all that which suits and meets your highest purpose touch lives i ask that you touch lives those that are out there lord listening and watching that are that are lonely they're isolated they're hungering for more of you and hungering for spiritual community even those that have given up on spiritual community, Father God. I pray you would reach out in your tenderness and you would touch every life, every man, every woman, every older person, every young person, Father God, uh, the, that the hope that is in Christ would become real, not just in our personal intimacy with you, but that who you are in those around us, who you are to others in the body of Christ would become a substantive, loving, robust connection one to another that makes a difference in our life. That we let others make a difference in our life. And that uh, we're making a difference in the lives of others by love. We're never going to step out of love, Father God, because love never fails. And we worship you. We praise your name. We acknowledge you, God. We acknowledge you today in this media church meeting. We gather in your name. We invoke, Father God, we invoke your name. We invoke the name that is above every name. And we worship and we honor and we praise and adore you, Father. Sotaba Rabon Debeke. Basta barabon de ste, stada barabon de stada bakasta, basta barabon de, bada barabon se te de mi kiste, tota barabon de she kista barabasata da bada bakostata. Thank you, Father God. We worship you. We praise and we adore you today. It's so exciting to do what we do. We're coming to the conclusion of. Uh, Another year. <laughs> we started a little over a year ago on the Jericho Drive. The Lord told us we would do 12 major cities in 12 months, and we went to 66 cities. 
and during that time and we did everything from church meetings to small groups to small conferences to one-on-one -on -one meetings I re it's so sweet I remember several times where people would text us and they would say we see you're driving out of our area today can we meet at a restaurant can I buy you lunch we've connected with spiritual family everywhere we went a tremendous hunger I know sometimes if you get uh, landlocked into one particular expression of the body of Christ if if there's not a fire burning you might get kind of turned sour and think well where is the spiritual hunger well let me tell you something we have experienced and witnessed and can testify to the tremendous hunger uh, for God hunger for his voice desire to see the prophetic touch people's lives and Kitty and I are discerning enough to know that the prophetic and the hunger for the prophetic it's not about us we're just a conduit uh, to bring the voice of God you know God has a voice he won't leave you without answers for your life it's now going on three years we've done the daily prophetic word and we've sent that out and every morning God has been faithful to speak and from the testimonies that come back it's effective your lives have been changed we we had an email today of someone saying how their life has been changed their spiritual life has been strengthened and we hear that on a consistent basis I can't tell you how gratifying that is to us for the work and the, the labor that we do uh, sometimes we our vitality is just a little bit tapped and and uh, it's it's kind of with somewhat humor you know I say that's why they call it the work of the ministry <laughs> and I say that but yet I say that because that's what God has told me at times that we were tired at times that we lacked strength and the Lord said son that's why they call it the work of the ministry uh, they say that's why God doesn't have that many friends because he's a real user <laughs> but it's a delight to be used of the Father to touch lives now I want to minister to you today on the subject of the kingdom of God and the relationship of the kingdom of God to the righteousness of God Matthew 6:33 says seek first the kingdom and all these things and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you the word kingdom is basilea it's the rule of God so we're to seek his kingdom well we better find out what that kingdom is we're to seek his righteousness we better find out what that is righteousness has to do with entitlement you know sometimes religion seems to imply if we just grovel as though we have no standing in the things of God that that's somehow what God wants but if you study the word righteousness you find out it's about entitlement it's about the ability to stand upright in God's presence he wants not just servants but he wants sons who will stand before him in uprightness, in entitlement, and know that he's backing them up uh, in their life here on the earth. King David wrote in Psalm 103, 19, he said, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Now, Paul talked about three heavens there's the heaven which is the natural environment the first heaven where you and I operate and we walk around in here on the earth then there is the second heaven which is the intermediate realm where angels and demons uh, inter interact and move in the unseen realm that's what um, Jacob gave witness to when he saw a ladder come down from heaven it's the intermediate realm between the throne and the first heaven and then there is the third heaven which is where the throne of God uh, rests and it's interesting that the thro the Bible teaches that he is enthroned in our hearts this is the kingdom that Jesus said in some inexplicable way that satisfies him whether we understand it or not that it's something that's on the inside of us so the heavens 
that he has that the Lord has established that Psalm 103 talks about is a heaven whose portal is on the inside of us. We hear a lot about portals. And uh, if you want to study about portals, go study the places where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob built altars. Because Abraham made an altar and poured oil upon stones and sacrificed animals at Bethel. And then two generations later, Jacob stumbled upon that very spot and woke up in the night and found himself staring into a portal. Everywhere there is a sacrifice, everywhere you build an altar, there is a portal that is geolocated. You understand that the, the true portal is on the inside of you, but you establish ancillary portals of the heavens where altars of... Con Why do you think... That, that the devil loves to keep you prayerless? Why do you think that the enemy doesn't want you finding a place of consecration? Doesn't want you to find a place of wrestling, uh, even as Jacob did at the ford of the Jabbok Brook? Because everywhere there is an altar, there is a portal established. So it is, portals are something, the kingdom of God is something that is established through ancillary portals that are geolocated but then also it's something that's on the inside of you. It's what's on the inside of you that determines what is manifested outwardly which is why Jesus said in Luke 17 that the king, they wanted to know when's the kingdom going to come? He says you're looking at the kingdom of God as God's linear purpose through time. You need to understand that it's not when, it's where. And the kingdom is uh, not in some far off distant dimension. It's on the inside of you. He said you're not, only, you're not getting the right answers because you're not asking the right questions. But the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. He rules in the third heaven. He rules in the second heaven where angels and demons are uh, operate in that unseen realm all, all around us. And guess what? He rules here in the first heaven in the natural realm uh, as well. The governments of men can delude themselves uh, to assume that they are in control. But let me tell you something. God is in control. We talked about this in Fort Wayne about the scripture says in Psalm, Proverbs 16, I believe it's 23 or 24, it says man tosses the coin or casts the lot, but God decides the outcome. Daniel said that the Lord sets up kings and rulers. He brings one down and he sets up another. Uh, man can pull the voting lever, but it's God who decides who sits uh, in the Oval Office. And our political uh, aspirations and our political bent uh, should be tempered by that overarching reality that regardless whether it's the man that we voted for or not, that ultimately it is God who puts one in authority. And so we don't need to be concerned of calling for the military overthrow of the federal government. and We don't need to be fantasizing about someone uh, assassinating the president because he's not from our political stripe. But we need to go to our knees you realize that the early church, Christians were slaughtered wholesale in the early church. They were, when Paul made the statement we should pray for kings and those in authority that we might live a quiet and peaceable life, he said that while Nero, the emperor Nero, was burning Christians to light his garden parties. The early church, brothers and sisters, was not an insurgent church, neither was it a political church. It was a church that put its confidence in a living God. And it, they were not um, like um, Gandhi, who believed in passive resistance. And yes, Gandhi got some things done, but let me tell you something. The early church brought the world power, brought the known world government to its knees within three generations and took over civilized government as we know because they understood that their power was on their knees and their power was through fidelity to a higher government the government of God this is why Jesus said if my servants were of this world then they would fight he told Pilate but they're not of this world because our resistance originates according to a higher dynamic it's the dynamic 
that is activated when you get on your knees and heaven and earth are moved as we align the words of our mouth and the petitions of our heart with the agenda of heaven. So it's God's kingdom that rules over all. Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7, for unto us a child is born. Do you realize that he not only is he the unique son of God, he's also the firstborn of many brethren. So to some degree much broader than we realize that he, what is said of him in this passage is also said of us. He said unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. And he's our brother. <laughs> And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, the Bible plainly teaches Jesus is the head and we're the body. And the shoulder connected to the head is part of the body. It said the government of God shall be upon his shoulder. And you and I are part of that. And his name shall be called Wonderful. In other words, because of the government of God extended through its many members, because of that, his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, because he's being wonderful in and through us. He's being counselor in and through us. He's being mighty God in and through us. He's not just uh, working that around us while we sit in passive observation. The kingdom of God doesn't come with observation, Jesus said. He's going to be mighty God in and through us. He's going to be the everlasting Father in and through us the prince of peace and of the increase. You know, I remember the uh, film that I watched back in the 70s that depicted what the, they thought the rapture would be and it showed the Antichrist overthrowing the entire humanity and this couple of Christians had run to the mountains and were hiding in a cabin and uh, right whenever uh, the Antichrist was about to come in and get them, uh, then one of those two people uh, backslid and accepted the Antichrist, and only one person made it to heaven. Well, you know what? That doesn't fit this verse of Scripture. If, if that's your picture of a grow worse mentality, it's like the Lord has said many times to me, the doom and gloomers have seen some things, but they haven't seen it all, because you're going to have to strip out this next verse, verse 7, it says, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end on the throne of David and upon his kingdom both to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever and it's the zeal of the Lord of hosts that's going to perform this you know sometimes we get a picture of a uh, altruistic God that has somehow distanced himself and he's beyond passion and he's beyond being emotionally invested into his process because he's God. But that's a, that's a worldly viewpoint of God. He's a zealous God. He's a jealous God. He's a loving God. He's passionate. He's passionate. He laughs. He grieves. He rejoices. He acts in our behalf. And you and I are participators in this government that he said is whose increase will not fail. Jesus said he would build his church. And the word he used for church was ecclesia. The English word for church actually comes from an old English word that means Kirk, like Captain Kirk, interestingly enough. And uh, the word Kirk actually refers to, or where we get the word church, it refers to a sacred edifice. A sacred edifice. But the ecclesia, the word Jesus actually used, and I don't know why they didn't translate it differently, it means a governmental body. The ecclesia is not a building or a social group or a religious infrastructure, but it's a governmental body intended to war and intended to rule. Ruling and reigning with Christ, it's not for some far off time, but it's a here and now proposition. I like what my brother Randall has said. He said, some people just can't take now for an answer. Do you realize that with God, there's neither time 
past or present in God. But it's always now. God is a now God. I like the verse in Hebrews that says, Now faith. Faith is always now. I've been to conferences right here in the city of Springfield. I've sat in conferences with hundreds of people rejoicing about what happened a hundred years ago and glorifying God for what's, what was going to happen in the near future. But they had no faith and no confidence in what God was doing right there and then. And I looked around and I saw sick people and I saw people who needed the baptism in the Holy Ghost and people who needed to get saved. And they were so distracted by what happened back then or what God was supposedly going to do sometime soon. And it was a total and complete delusion. We do not need to be deluded by looking back. Now look, I'm a student of church history. I'm a student of revival. But we don't need to be distracted by what happens in eternity future or what happened a hundred years ago. Jesus said many people will not do and they will not act because they say, well, Jesus is fixing to come back. But Jesus said, occupy till I come. That means we're not going to be disappointed if he comes before the end of this broadcast. But we're going to carry out our lives like he's not coming back for a thousand years. We're going to put our foot in the neck of the enemy. We're going to believe God for the total overthrow of Satan's agenda in every culture that spans this globe. We're going to rule and reign now. We're not waiting to overthrow the enemy in some eternity that we can't be responsible for. We're going to accept our responsibility, appropriate our possessions, walk in victory, and get answers now. And then if he wants to to usurp that by uh, coming and taking us to himself in the next 30 seconds that's okay with us let us be found faithful to believe and faithful to act so ruling and reigning in Christ is not for some far off time it's a now proposition you are a principality and a power now. And boy, I get a lot of people to give me blowback on that. Well, I thought the devil was the principality and power. Well, show me when God ordained him. He simply took the vacated throne of authority. God told Adam, you have dominion. I'm giving you dominion. And when he sinned and he fell, Satan took up the dominion that Adam emptied himself of. And when Jesus came, he said, All power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. He took back all rule. And he says, go, Now you go. He gave back to us. He took back the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And he's reestablished it. And your ruling and reigning begins now. You're ruling and reigning now. You are in training for reigning now. And it is your privilege. And it's also your responsibility to walk in the earth as a representative, now notice the word, an ambassador of the government of God. And look at that. Think about that a minute and let's look at that verse of scripture in the words of Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Now let's read into what that's saying to us. You are an ambassador. You are a governmental authority. Didn't say after Jesus comes back in the rapture. He says this is what you are now. You have governmental authority now. Now you are standing, notice what the verse says, you are standing in God's stead. Now, Paul further stated, look over at uh, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. He said, be therefore followers of God as dear children. So you are ambassadors for Christ, you are a government official in the kingdom of God. You are ambassadors. That means you are standing in God's stead. Right there in your life, in that car you're driving in, in that house you're sitting in, you are standing in that life, in that job, in that marriage, in that family, in that community. You are standing in God's stead. You are a representative of the government of God and it's a government that's continually on the increase on the inside of you. So what do you do? You follow Ephesians chapter 5. You do what God would do in every situation. In every situation you are to do what God would do 
if he were in your position because he is in your position. He came to place himself in your position and conversely to place you in his position which is why Ephesians 2 says you're seated with Christ in heavenly places in Christ. We need to forget this less than mentality. We need to begin to aspire to the audacious faith that believes we can do what he said uh, we can do. That as he is, 1 John says, as he is, so are we in the earth. Well, how is he? Well, he's not under uh, the jack boot of the devil. He's not up there checking his bank balance to see if he can get pay the light bill in heaven. He's not up there wringing his hands and losing his faith over kids that aren't living right. He's not up there concerned about his woman who's the bride of Christ who isn't always having her mind where, where it ought to be. What's he doing? He's laying his life down for that woman. He's praying for that woman. And that's what you and I, and he's not praying those weak, anemic prayers. He's not praying prayers that only represent a coping strategy. He's praying for us that we'll have the over-the-top, 100% implementation of everything that the cross paid for. When you understand the nature of the kingdom as Jesus taught, you may discover that there's a wide gap between what Christianity has become and what the kingdom of God can be in your life. In Scripture, the term kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven primarily appear in the Gospel of Matthew. Of the 68 times the kingdom of God is mentioned, all but two references were in the sayings of Jesus. Now you think about that a minute. 66 times it was mentioned in the sayings of Jesus, but in the Great Commission, did Jesus not direct his disciples to preach the kingdom? But yet there is almost zero reference in the teaching of the Twelve after the Ascension on the subject of the kingdom. This leads us to question whether or not the apostles truly understood the message that Jesus in the Great Commission commanded them to preach. Because if they'd have got it, you'd thought they'd have talked a whole lot more about it. We want to focus on that understanding. Matthew 6.33 What is the relationship between the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God because proper understanding of that results in all things being added. All things. All means all. <laughs> you fill in the blank. It's like God, Matthew 6.33 functions like a blank check in your life if you find out. Now whatever it is he meant, there's a lot of things that men think about the kingdom and the righteousness, but let's suffice to say that God had something in his mind when Jesus said that. And if we could determine what that is, then we can activate the all things being added. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. Of all the verses in the Bible or sayings of Jesus, this verse is the quintessential statement that expresses in the fewest words what the kingdom is and what it can mean to each one of us. Now, note first of all the proximity in the phraseology between the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God. If you seek the kingdom and the righteousness, then all things are going to be added to you. Now when we say that, all oh, the kingdom, the righteousness, we tend to take it as poetry. And we don't dig down deeper into the definitions. So let's not assume that we know what this is. Let's look past the poetry and the phraseology and not assume that we know exactly what is meant. Because righteousness is, we've talked already about the kingdom is the word basilea. It means the rule of God. What about righteousness? Righteousness is more than a moral quality. Righteousness is more than being upright in character. The word righteousness there carries with it the meaning of entitlement and privilege. Now, I want you to see God's process here. It says that when you do something, when you seek these things, God initiates you and inducts you into His process by which righteousness is produced in your life. Righteousness, what does that look like at ground level? 
At ground level, righteousness is everything you say and do becoming as effective as if God said it or did it. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness is produced in your life, which results in all things being added. And all means all. Fill in the blank. Healing of your marriage. Healing of your body. Provision. He became poor so that you could be rich. Salvation. Kids getting right with God. You know, that, you know, religion wants to throw in all these caveats. You know, well, yeah, but. But Jesus, I love the blanket statements, faith statements of Jesus. He made these open-ended promises. And if he hadn't have made them, and we made them today, we'd be called heretics. We'd be called, we'd, they'd say we're in false doctrine. In fact, when you say what Jesus says, they will say you're in false doctrine. But I challenge you to go back and look at the blanket faith statements of Jesus and find all the religious objections, caveats, and gotchas they throw in there to explain away why God won't do what He can do and it's your fault. That's not what the heart of God is toward us. The wording there about all things being added is derived from a word that means they will be placed they will be laid aside for you. They will be annexed into your jurisdiction. That's an interesting word. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all things will be annexed into your life. What does that mean? You're going to take territory because God is the ultimate territorial spirit. Are there things outside your control? When you seek first the kingdom and His righteousness, He's going to annex those things that are beyond your control into your jurisdiction. Do you understand that? He's going to bring them in t under the uh, mantle of your diplomatic immunity. You are an ambassador after all. He's going to put those things that you have desire of and you have need of, He's going to put them into a diplomatic uh, pouch for you that the enemy doesn't have a right uh, to access. When you seek the kingdom and His righteousness, His entitlement, it's the rule of God and the entitlement that comes with it. The kingdom of God is the rule of God. The righteousness of God is the entitlement that comes with it. When you seek the kingdom something and, and His righteousness, something called all things, is annexed into the spiritual territory or geography of your life. Kingdoms throughout history from time to time have annexed new territory. When your city wants to raise taxes, it will annex new territory, new, new property that's being developed. When a city or a territory is annexed, all of the inhabitants therein become citizens of that kingdom or that municipality or that jurisdiction and come under its protectorate. So, when you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, there, your finances, your health, your uh, family, your spouse, your job, your community, they become annexed into the territory of the king. They come out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son because of your ambassadorship in seeking the kingdom of God. Then what Jesus did and what he provided on the cross 2,000 years ago begins to be applied to the things and the people, the relationships and the geography, spiritual geography and natural geography around you. There are things that are added to you. These things speak of your hopes. When you seek the kingdom and his righteousness, then your hopes and your dreams are brought into the protectorate of God's grace and blessing. So Jesus is saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. And as you respond affirmatively to the voice and the influence of the Father, then there are rights and privileges that will accrue to you that will manifest financially, relationally, in your health, in every area of your life when you submit not to the rule of man, but to the rule of God. Further, further down in the passage, he specifically includes things that religious thinkers exclude. He touches on things that challenge us right down to right where we live. Matthew 6.31 says, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink? In other words, he says, let's, not, let's set that aside. Let me show you how that isn't even an issue. Wherewith shall you be clothed? By seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness. So Jesus exhorts us. He encourages us to seek 
Let's find out what that means. To seek, to pursue, to strive after, to aim at, to seek, require, demand, to crave. I crave the kingdom. To demand something, the wording is, if you look the original word up, to demand something from anyone. It's like the scripture says, concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. Man, you quote that verse, and every religious devil on the internet wants to argue with you about that. But Jesus said, we, when he said we should seek the kingdom, he said we should demand, we should crave, we should demand. It's like my wife, whenever she found out about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, she told her friend, give him to me. <laughs> In other words, that might not have been good theology, but it's something that God responded to and he baptized her in the Holy Ghost. So it's to demand, it's to crave. And notice it says to seek first. See, we want to put Jesus first. So that does not illegitimize desire for other things. You seek first the kingdom, but I'd like to have a Corvette too. <laughs> I don't want a Corvette, but you notice that he's not excluding other desires. You know, that's one thing the devil did with Eve. Oh, don't, don't touch it. No, he just said don't eat it. The devil's always tr trying to push to pervert God's thoughts. He said seek first. He didn't say seek exclusively. He makes room for natural desires. He makes room to be naturally supernatural. Isn't that interesting? Seek first the kingdom. To seek first in time, first in place. And first in any succession of things or persons, first in rank, first in influence, first in honor, to be chief, principal, first, at the first. So when your life is annexed by the kingdom of God, then the king will confer citizenship rights upon you. Now, Jesus can only give you what he has to give. What he gives, or the scope of what he gives, is expressed in righteousness. And that word righteousness, it means entitlement. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, and 31 says, God made Jesus to be our righteousness. What does that mean? That means you can stand upright in the economy of God because of who Jesus is. And you can ask God to answer prayers not on the basis of what you have done, but on the basis of what Jesus has done. That's what righteousness means. When you look deeper at the meaning of the word he used for righteousness, you can see that it is the state of him who is as he ought to be. Here's how you are what you ought to be. Not religious performance, not fasting, Bible memorization, attending church every time the doors are open. That doesn't make you as you ought to be. Sometimes those things render you useless because you put your confidence in your performance rather than in Christ. But it's who Jesus is on the inside of you that renders you as you ought to be. It's descriptive of a condition of being made acceptable to God. You know, Hebrews 7, 2 says, calls Jesus the king of righteousness. He's the king who has the approbation of God and then confers that approbation or that approval. Jesus is the only one that truly has the approval of God, but because of who he is, he's able to confer that approval, the approval of God, the stamp of God's approval on your life. Oh, well, we don't want to do that because people might sin. No, you don't understand. The goodness of God will cause you to see him, and when you see him, you'll be like him. People are out there struggling and wrestling with their sin and it's like wrestling with a greased pig. You trying to wrestle with that habit and you get all over you what's all over that pig, that pig of sin that's contaminating your life. No, you need to embrace him, pursue him. And when you pursue him, you get all over you what's all over him and what's all over him is the glory of God and you see him and then you become like him and suddenly those things that bound you, those besetting sins, whatever they are, of immorality, uh, habits of, of life, well, unforgiveness, those things fall away because they're burned out of you by the glory of God that's manifest in your life because you're pursuing and seeking His person. So Jesus took the approval the Heavenly Father gave Him and He confers it to us as the Father's acceptance. He's able to transmigrate God's approval on Him to God's acceptance of us. And then he accepts us and gives us the opportunity to mature into his approval and his authority and his power. <laughs> so in effect, Jesus is saying to the Father, 
He says, I know they don't deserve to be blessed or to be in our kingdom, but I want you to do it for my sake, Father. Because of you approve of me, Father, I'm asking you to overlook the fact that Russ Walden's a rascal and accept him anyway and deal with him, not because of who he is, but because of who Jesus, who, who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for me. Even though we don't deserve it. But he's at the, Jesus asked the Father to deal with us, undeserving though we may be, Asks us to de ask the Father to deal with us as He would with Him. Again, 1 Corinthians 1.30. Of Him are you in Christ Jesus. He's in you, you're in Him. Who of God is made unto us wisdom, my wisdom is a person. And righteousness, my righteousness is a person. My sanctification, I know so sanctification is a process. No, my sanctification is a person. His name is Jesus. And He is my redemption. My redemption is more than a sinner's prayer. It's more than a new birth experience. Uh, my redemption um, fulfills, and ex the scope of my redemption exceeds that of the theology of a born-again experience or an evangelical philosophy of Christianity. We need to get to the place that our Christianity or our relationship with God can no longer be expressed within the confines of an evangelical theology because he's more than that. God is no more an evangelical than he is a Democrat or a Republican. He, his, his, the parameters of his kingdom and the basis of relationship to him cannot be contained within these confines. We've, we have a dead religion. We have dead, dry, leaves of theology that will no longer satisfy the masses that are crying out for spiritual reality. We need to set aside those false fidelities and embrace the king. Kiss the son, uh, Psalm says, lest he be angry with thee. We want to kiss his feet. We want to come to him and pour our life out like oil, like alabaster, and wash his feet and dry them with our tears and let the experiential reality of who Jesus is impact our life to the point that increasing government literally eclipses everything that in us that is contrary to his nature and causes us to manifest, to see him as he is and to be like him and his paternity is made manifest in our lives and we go out manifesting we go out demonstrating as he is so are we in the earth we become a definition of the kingdom and if we're going to define the kingdom we have to define it through the lens of this verse in Matthew 6.33 in defining the kingdom, it includes that which confers upon us, yes, responsibilities, but rights and privileges. The rule of God, the kingdom, and the righteousness of God, the entitlement, as defined by what Jesus demonstrated in his earth walk. See, Jesus is the pattern citizen. He has shown us what a human life looks like when walking in fully activated kingdom privilege. See, what Jesus patterned for you and what he patterned for me is not something from the past or something unique only to himself or something in the distant future. Whatever the kingdom of God is, it is something on the inside of you now as a resource and an entitlement here and now, not unavailable to us in this life. Again, Luke 17, 20, 21. He was demanded of the Pharisees, the theologians, the thinkers, all the do-nothings that sat around and decided there wasn't nothing to do. He, they were asked when the kingdom of God should come, and he answered, he said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. In other words, you're not getting the right answers because you're not asking the right questions. He said, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. We want to be careful with outward dependencies. We don't want to become outward dependent on any ministry, on any teaching, or any understanding because the kingdom of God is on the inside of you. The brother and sister, the kingdom of God is in you. It is entitling you. It is empowering you. It is provisioning you. It is directing and guiding you. And as a prophet, my job is to point not to the kingdom out there, but to the kingdom in you. 
The kingdom out there doesn't matter. It's the kingdom in you that's going to put you over in life. The kingdom it's at hand is the kingdom in you. The kingdom that is near is the kingdom in you. The kingdom that's breaking through is the kingdom in you. It is breaking through in you and upon you and around you. It's affecting every area of your life and putting you over and touching the life of every person you love and every person you care for. Seeking first the kingdom and His righteousness. So I invite you to become kingdom seekers. What do you do with this message? Every day, when you wake up, you ask the question, what does seek first the kingdom look like? Every time the, the enemy puts pressure on you, you go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. How do I imitate God? What am I going to do? I like the story Kenneth Hagin tells. And uh, he's gone on to glory now. He gathered his deacons around him. They were having church trouble. And what are we going to do, Pastor? We're going to do what God would do if he was in our shoes. What would God do? You talk to the devil like you talk to a stray dog that's done come in your jurisdiction. You begin to speak with authority. Begin to require and demand. Begin to expect when you open your mouth, God will not allow your words to fall to the ground. Let me tell you something. There is a point in life that you're going to feel the mantle of authority come on you and the Lord's going to say to you what He said to me years ago, if you say it, I'll do it. If you won't say it, I won't do it. That's the authority of the kingdom of God. That is the, in one statement, that is the responsibility and the entitlement. You are the entitled of God. So we bless you and I trust that you've received from this live Media Church event. Remember, next Thursday at this exact time, 7 Central, we're coming back here using the same numbers that you've used to access, whether you're on Spreaker or whether you're coming to us on Ustream or through the conference call. We invite you to come and to pray with us because prayer is not begging and pleading. It's ruling and reigning. I want you to know I counted in honor. I counted in honor to wash your feet in the prophetic, to wash your feet in the mantling, the anointing that God has given me. I pray for a full release, Father. Whatever you are and whatever you've been in my life, Father God, I pray for a full release. All that which you've given to me, I give to this person who's watching or listening. I, bring, I command release. I command the fire of God to be released, to heal, to deliver, to mend, to provide in Jesus' name. We command it to be so because that's our privilege and that's our responsibility. God bless you. Thank you for connecting with us. Give us a testimony. I always like to hear, was the broadcast a blessing to you? Was it, uh, did it reach you? The technology, did it reach you with any level of quality? I appreciate hearing back so we can correct things and do things better because we want to be the best that we can be to reach out and bless your life. God bless you. We will see you next Thursday for the War Room event.